We would have been princes. I. Enough Hennessy for an after party. Thank God, Buddha, the monks, and the CHA, who didn't get as drunk as usual, who piloted the prayers and ceremonies with aplomb, and don't forget those other party animals who trashed the banquet room whom the cousins called Mings and Pose because, sure, everyone at the reception was related, anyone over the age of 40 was definitely someone's auntie or uncle blessed them all, the wedding was done. And the cousins of the bride could at last liberate themselves from their duties, from the itchy traditional outfits that were rentals, so nobody knew if they'd ever really been washed, from the praying in 100 degree weather, chanting words that meant nothing to the bride and groom, getting palm flowers chucked at their faces by tipsy guests, and, most tedious of all, from being subjected, whether as witness or participant, to the never-ending photo ops with the bridal party arranged. In the middle of a golf course, next to a man-made lake, during the golden hour of sunrise, and then again, twelve hours later, backlit by the sunset, with the groom shaking the hands of his groomsmen individually and then all at once, like they were playing the human knot, and then, of course, a candid. Candid. Shot of the bride and her bridesmaids having their makeup repainted, then the bride posing with her parents, then with her siblings, then with her half-siblings, then with her cousins, second cousins, third cousins twice removed, then with the in-laws, then with the family that owns Chuck's Donuts and the other family that owns Angkor Pharmacy, and finally these same poses all over again, but in the white, American dress. So let the real drinking commence. Their new location was still undetermined, but it hardly mattered any place, but Dragon Palace Restaurant, which had been packed to the gills with 300 California Valley Cambos. No more stuck-up pose pretending they have royal blood, that this city was the Hollywood of celebrity ex-refugees, that the sidewalk off El Dorado Street was one giant red carpet for them to strut down. No more downplaying how much they drank in front of their gongs and moss. The younger crowd knew better than to get sloshed in front of their 70-year-old devout Buddhist grandparents who had survived not just genocide, but the autogenocide. Especially not after the bride's fifth favorite cousin, Marlon straddling the edge of blackout drunk like a true recovering drug addict danced with too much verve next to the famous singer, who had been flown out from Phnom Penh by their resident Rich Ming. But now the grown-ups were gone. The bride and groom were already on their way to Vegas for honeymoon gambling. Even Marlon's younger brother, Bond, the bride's eighth favorite cousin, had loosened the tie looped around his neck. The famous singer was asking for a ride to Rich Ming's vacant rental home, which was both the headquarters for the bridal party, and also guest lodgings for the famous singer. Her voice coarse from singing for hours on end, the famous singer needed a hot lemon water to soothe her throat, she claimed, and drank tea brewed only with Evian mineral water. Here I am to save the day. Marlon screamed, launching himself, in himself into the air, landing on a chair before the famous singer. Holding two unopened bottles of Hennessy cognac, he jumped down and fell to one knee, as if offering booze in exchange for her hand in marriage. I'll even drive you. You are drunk, boy, the famous singer whispered, unwilling to raise her voice now that she was no longer, technically, on the clock. Then my beautiful brother will drive us. Marlon sang. He pointed a bottle to the right, though Bond stood to his left. But you gotta bring everyone home for an after party. He swung his bottles around to indicate that he meant the twenty and thirty year olds scattered about the empty dinner tables, all the cousins of the bride. The famous singer aimed her symmetrical face at Bond. How much did you drink? She asked, her fake eyelashes batting a mini hurricane. We need more time in your presence. Marlon slurred. It's okay, I can drive, Bond said, eyes glued to the famous singer's six-inch heels. So what do you say? Marlon asked, standing up and grinning. Something about his unabashed drunkenness, his gleeful childlike pronouncements, complimented his broad shoulders. Party with us? Was it blood that zoomed to the famous singer's cheeks, or just maternal pity? Being handsome and pathetic was Marlon's selling point. Mothers adored that poor fellow brimming with wasted possibility. Fine, but I need to drink my lemon water, the famous singer said, and the crowd of cousins cheered. Everyone snatched a bottle of leftover Hennessy, a takeout box of lobster scraps and fried rice drenched in lobster juice, 
and then rallied to Rich Ming's rental home. 2. A rundown of the objective, as Marlin's too drunk to remember. Bon knew he should have stopped Marlin from the beginning. All night he'd wanted to yank the Heinekens from Marlin's grasp. Wanted to intercept his older brother's swigs of cognac, like a basketball player blocking his opponent's every shot. But he was no athlete, not like Marlin. He worked as a paralegal in San Francisco, but thought of himself as a struggling painter who lived in Oakland the word struggling feeling more redundant with every passing year, despite his BA in art practice from UC Berkeley. Driving their dad's new Lexus SUV, Bond glanced into the rearview mirror and saw Marlin's drunken body sprawled across the back seat, while in the passenger seat the famous singer reapplied her lipstick. It must be hard to look that good, Bond thought, before recalling Marlin in rehab, how his brother had gelled his hair every morning, swept it into a seamless black wave. Bond figured it was the best way Marlin could remember who the hell he was. Marlin sat up, and in the rearview mirror, his limbs appeared to snap into their rightful place. He leaned forward, bracing himself against the center console. The smell of alcohol and sweat rushed into the front half of the car. Who the fuck even is Visith? He's our parents' second cousin, Bond said in a mock serious, flat voice. Just closer to our age. He owns the jewelry place on March Lane. You're so drunk you forgot your own uncle? No, I get that, Marlin answered. I want to know why he, like, matters. Of course he'd already forgotten. Bond gripped the steering wheel harder, the fat premium leather awkward in his hands. He fought the urge to pick at his stress acne. A scene from earlier that night crashed into his thoughts, their mom in tears, pushing away her plate of lobster, ditching their dinner table to sit by herself after she'd tried scolding the tipsy out of Marlin's bloodstream, to which Marlin had joked, it's not like I'm on meth. At the center of the table were wide glass cylinders, filled with drowning orchids and topped by candles. How Bond had wished the bride would turn off, off the ceiling lights. It would have been the craziest, most amazing painting, all those tiny floating flames. Now the famous singer was glittering the area around her eye sockets, lightly dabbing her skull with two fingers. Visit is a good Khmer name, she said. Not like you two, who do not have Khmer names at all. Fuck that shit. Marlon shouted into their ears. We're named after Marlon Brando and James fucking Bond. Which in fact the logic's so Cambodian it hurts, name your kids after the first movies you saw after immigrating, and bam. Marlon clapped his hands together, the sound like thunder. American dream achieved. He thrashed his head up and down to the Kanye song playing on the radio. Marlon Brando. Like Stella, Stella. The famous singer sang, and Marlon joined her. Stella yeah, yeah. His head banging escalated into a solitary mosh pit. Anyway, Bond said, we gotta find out how much Visit gifted at the wedding. He was referring to the mission they'd agreed on back at the reception, while unloading themselves in adjacent urinals. The drunkenness had temporarily drained out of Marlin, enough for him to realize the extent that he must have bruised their mom's feelings. It'll calm her down to know, Bond had told his older brother, as they washed their hands with the restaurant's diluted pink soap. It was the best they could do. Remember? For mom. Right, Marlin said, breathing more alcohol yet into the Lexus. For mom. That night, before their mother had stormed off in tears, the bride, the groom, and the bridal party, in a customary procession, zigzagged through the dinner tables, collecting on pavs the bridesmaids had placed on every seat. Seat. Subjecting the newlyweds to hazing rituals, the grown-ups stood on their chairs and forced the bride to grab their red gift envelopes, all stuffed with cash, from high above her head, with only her teeth, while they also cheered for the groom to plant wet kisses on the lips of Ming's and Moss and one wasted gong. At their table, Marlin and Bond's dad, a strict proponent of tradition who loved to outclass his peers, had initially filled their family's collective envelopes with $6,000 which induced their mom to plead, desperately, for the family to spend less money, in case something horrible happened, such as though it was left unsaid Marlin's pill addiction resurfacing and his returning to rehab. 
Then Marlin spotted Visith heading for the bathroom, right as the bridal procession was approaching his table. Whoa, is Visith trying to swerve his gifting duties? Marlin casually asked, igniting a frenzy of outraged speculations from their mom, who would now bond knew not be able to sleep at all. Her righteous indignation, when peaked, was known to rev up her chronic insomnia. I swear, on Buddha himself, Marlin said, re-sprawling his limbs across the back seat, Visith fucking slipped his own pav right into his pocket so he could ignore it. The famous singer shook her head. That is not okay, she said. He is of the age to be giving back. The bride and the groom need that money to build new lives. Yeah, and our parents are hella petty, Marlin added. They're, like, dying for an excuse to give jack shit at Visitha's own stupid wedding, you know, especially if he ain't paying his dues. Our mom can't stand him. She doesn't wanna attend his wedding next month it's basically a green card marriage for this rando chick from Badambang whose parents are buying Visitha a new goddamn house, but our pops is making her go. Go. She's hated the motherfucker ever since the guy sold her fake S diamonds. Which she got refunded, Bond said. Only after hounding him for weeks, Marlin said. And he gave some bullshit explanation about inventory errors. So Visit is not respectable, the famous singer said, retouching her face with blush. Shame he has a Rolex too, like a hard worker. Marlin made an ugly sound around his tongue. He wears Rolexes as marketing for his jewelry store, Bond explained, and Marlin contributed an even more obnoxious noise. Still, Bond continued, rolling his eyes, Visit has decent business, so it's hard to see why he wouldn't shell out some money. It's not like everyone in the family needs to give more than, like, a hundred bucks. He turned the car left, onto the street that was lined with the rental properties owned by Rich Ming the lady had practically bought up the whole neighborhood. He slowed down and squinted to see the address numbers on the dark houses. Yeah, well, Marlin said, motherfucker never tips at Ming Li's noodle shop either. You're fucking drunk, Bond said. We need, like, actual proof. If not for mom, then for dad to agree with mom. You cannot inquire with the bride? The famous singer asked. Oh my god, have you met her? Marlin sprang back into an upright position. Let's just get him, like, seriously messed up, he said, reaching into the pocket of his younger brother's suit jacket, which caused Bond to jerk the car into a whiplashing stop, the tires screeching against the asphalt. Jesus Christ. Bond yelled, elbowing his brother. Can you just not? Marlin backed off and grinned. He held up a joint. I knew you had one. He said. Now we can lure him into a confession people always spill when they're high. Getting him crossfaded isn't gonna do shit, Bond said, snatching his joint back from his brother. That's not our plan. Plan. You have a better idea? Marlin asked, and Bond grimaced. Okay. Fine, Bond said. That's the plan until we figure out a better plan. He almost blurted, please don't get more wasted yourself, but then found himself thinking, well, at least he's not doing meth. That is a dumb idea, the famous singer scoffed. What is wrong with asking the bride? Her mom's best friends would visit his older sister, for one thing, Bond said, stepping on the gas pedal. And both have big mouths. Our parents don't want anyone to know they're thinking of snubbing Visith. They hate gossip. Nah, Marlin said, they hate gossip when it's about them. It was past midnight when Bond parked in front of their destination. The house sat at the foot of the Delta's levee one of those ritzy waterfront pads its beaming windows the sole light on the block. The famous singer unbuckled her seatbelt, making even that look elegant. Without gossip, she said, how do you know not to respect a man with a Rolex? Preach, baby. Marlin howled and jumped out of the car. Then, alongside the famous singer, he shimmied his way to the house, totally forgetting about the wide-open door of the Lexus, because, whatever, his younger brother would take care of anything that required handling, right? In the stillness Marlin left behind, Bond inhaled and closed his eyes. He saw himself rendered in geometric brushstrokes, 
sitting in his dad's overpriced SUV and framed by the driver's window. A mixture of deep blues, fluorescent glows, and natural light from the moon. The background, the house atop a grassy mound, a beacon of bright yellow windows, and two figures ascending the lawn one, the famous singer, a silhouette of long hair, a modern apsara, and the other, a bulkier version of himself, a burst of energy drifting away. 3. The bridesmaids get the party started with some Mariah, Mariah Carey. He was buzzed. Not incapacitated, not off the wagon, and everyone especially his mom, and definitely his younger brother needed to chill the hell out. Marlon stood in the center of the living room and swayed. He double-fisted swigs of cognac and the neon green of a Gatorade he found in the fridge, which no one seemed to notice because no one appreciated that he knew how to handle his goddamn shit. Why is there no music playing? He yelled. I need to dance if I'm gonna enjoy my electrolytes. He threw his Gatorade into the air and caught it, then thanked Buddha that he had remembered to twist the bottle shut. He'd been thanking Buddha, as a joke, for all his fortunes, since doing a month-long stint at the dingy rehab of their hometown, which required each group therapy monologue to begin with I thank God I am alive. Do I have to do fucking everything? Screamed Monica, the local accountant, who did everyone's taxes pro bono, and who was also the bride's maid of honor and first favorite cousin, according to the number of Instagram posts of them posing at the club. Behind the kitchen island, Monica rummaged through a never-ending procession of overfilled plastic bags from the reception. Her fellow bridesmaids kept walking in through the front door with more junk to organize, catalog, recycle, dismantle, and return for a refund because the bride's parents hated being ripped off, despite their flair for decadence, so amply manifested in the course of this three-day wedding. And now, to top it off, apparently she had to make a hot lemon water for the famous singer, who was, as far as Monica could tell, a 40-year-old fake eyelash-wearing uppity motherfucking diva. Whoa, Marlon said, still swaying, guess I won't be applying for a spot in the bride tribe. He pointed at Monica's tank top, the words splayed across her chest in purple glitter. He faltered a bit, so Bond put his hand on Marlon's shoulder, tried to anchor him firmly to the ground. I'm fine, I'm fine, Marlon said. It's called dancing. Bond shrugged and walked over to the kitchen to help Monica. Come on. Marlon called after Bond. Don't get sucked into her shtick. I mean, does this really need to be done right now and not, like, tomorrow? This is an after party. When's the next time everyone's gonna visit home again? Let's have fun before the weekend's dead, before it's just me, stuck in this fake city, without my cambos. Me with nothing to do but go on bad Tinder dates to Chipotle. Someone yanked Marlon by his shirt sleeves, and he collapsed into the sectional couch. So that's what you think of your uncle. Visit said. I'm not enough for you? This why I never see you around. Visit grabbed and constrained his nephew the way Pose did when Marlon was young, when Marlon would be minding his goddamn business as he played with hand-me-down Hot Wheels, only to get yanked into some goading argument among the grown-ups to serve as a rhetorical pawn in their dialogue about morality or honor or whether King Sihanouk was worse than Pol Pot or whether The Killing Fields was actually a bad movie or why some cambos listened to hip-hop good-for-nothing trash music and others. Became model students who studied nursing or dentistry or even accounting. This dude definitely gifted squat, Marlon thought, wishing Bond had, had a telepathic connection straight to his brain. If you're our uncle, he said, it's, like, barely. Yeah, shut the fuck up, Visif. Monica yelled. Marlon's right, for once. Punch me in the face the day I start calling you Poe. She handed over to Bond a bag of fake Buddhist wedding favors, tiny silver goblets all filled with chocolates. What am I supposed to do with these? Bond asked. Get em out of my face, Monica answered. Just then, the rest of the bridesmaids and groomsmen and miscellaneous cousins second cousins, third cousins, other cambos unrelated to the bride, but whose families had escaped the regime with the bride's family through a forest of minefields charged into the living room and kitchen in an overwhelming surge of rowdy drunken shouting. The bag of favors vanished from Bond's grasp, 
and he felt the sensation he often experienced when visiting home that his parents had conceived him to work on a conveyor belt of nonsensical family issues. How else could he explain the tasks that continued to jam up the flow of his free time? Like attending debrief sessions with Marlon's rehab counselor, because their mom could barely deal, and their dad ignored any and all problems involving these sons of his who would never understand the horrors, the nightmares, the endless grief, that came with the autogenocide. Bond observed the open room. The famous singer had re-emerged from her bedroom, looking better than she did at the wedding. A bridesmaid was holding the decorated money box from the reception, but she promptly disappeared into the hallway. Maybe they didn't need to bother with Viziv, Bond thought, considering all those signed and sealed envelopes. Then he saw Viziv acting chummy with a fuming Marlin. Bond hoped his brother wouldn't say something stupid, that he would refrain from accusing a sober Viziv, outright. Outright, if he had snubbed the bride, because then Viziv would get offended and stories would spread about Marlin's offense, and then their parents' reputations would run the gauntlet of the Cambo rumor cycle which was the last thing anyone needed. He scanned the room again. Among the crowd of cousins, the bag of wedding favors was nowhere to be found. A shot glass appeared in Bond's hands, as two bridesmaids bounced across the room handing servings of Hennessy to everyone except Monica, who was given a whole bottle to alleviate her suffering as the maid of honor. The bridesmaids found a speaker and plugged its AUX cable into a phone. Can you really be a drunk Cambo without blasting Mariah Carey? One of them shouted. All I want for Christmas is you blared from the speaker, and Visit said, it's July, dumbass. So what? It's the best Mariah song. Marlon said, inciting fuck yes from the two bridesmaids. He broke free from Visit and started dancing in the middle of the living room, elbows bent close to his torso, shoulders bopping up and down. He waved at his younger brother and yelled, drink. Bond sighed, twisted his face, and downed his shot of cognac. The after-party had officially started, and Marlon felt relieved. The entire night he had yearned to ache into that warm nothingness. Hollow pangs of muscle memory throbbed in his thighs, his shoulders, the places where he had felt the most heat. Cravings pulsed through his whole body. But he would survive this night. If everyone had fun if his younger brother managed to chill out he could do it. He wanted to forget the damage he had done to his life, to dance and drink and pretend, at least for one night, that everything would be okay, that he could fill the emptiness inside with these cambos he loved. Grooving to Mariah Carey, Marlon looked straight into the kitchen's fluorescent lights. A stream of white seared his vision, flushed out his brain. He gulped down another swig. Four. Four. The Drunken Monologues Cambos deliver at 1.15 a.m. Someone take a picture of me in this bride tribe tank so I can post it on Instagram, tag the bride to make her happy, and change into my normal clothes, Monica said. Or, I don't know, kill myself whatever's easier with this giant s hair. For drinks deep, Monica had grown simultaneously angrier and more dutiful toward the bride. By now the after-party had spilled out into the garage and the hallway, where Bond was helping Monica, for no reason he could readily discern, stuff bags into a closet. How did you get your dress off and the tank on in the first place? Bond asked, genuinely curious. Monica's tightly wound locks fed a mess of frozen curls sitting on her head like an alien leech controlling her mind. I don't even know, she said. The dress was so tight on me, I went into a blind rage tearing it off. Maybe that's where the Ong Pavs went, Bond thought, peering into the closet. If so, he could see if there was a red envelope signed by Visif. Is the money box safe? He said, feeling clumsy for asking. Why, you gonna steal it or some shit? What, no Jesus? His phone buzzed, and to seem less flustered, Bond pulled it out to check his messages. A photo of Visith shotgunning a beer popped up, accompanied by a text from Marlon saying, too late. The garage party be bumpin', and I'm the game master. A response to Bond's earlier text saying, hold off on the plan, I think I found a better way. You should steal it, Monica said, her face engulfed in a red glow. Steal her money and then redistribute it to everyone as.
like reparations. She got, what, 50 grand for getting married. Why are we rewarding her? Anybody can get married. I can get married tomorrow. Old white guys fill out online forms and brides are FedEx ed to them. She brought the bottle to her mouth, with the alcohol, and mind a hurling face. I can't drink anymore or I'll die. Monica threw the bottle into Bond's hands. He thought of another painting, a gaudy portrait of Monica hideous hair, grotesque makeup, with the bride tribe tank rendered in a dramatic chiaroscuro then shook off the notion. I don't know he said, collecting his more decent thoughts. These weddings are kinda nice. I mean, when's the next time someone's gonna pay the famous singer to perform for us? Don't get me started on her. Monica yelled. All weekend she'd ordered me to make hot lemons. Once I had to do it three fucking times before it was right. How can you be picky about that? Monica took out the bag she had, only a second ago, stuffed into the closet, and started digging through it. Look, what needs to be done? Bond said, and then remembered, remembered pairing with Monica as lab partners in AP chemistry, how she would micromanage their experiments to death, doubling the work necessary to receive a good grade. He snatched the bag from her. I'll do it. You wouldn't do it right, she said, grabbing it back, and Bond felt like pulling out his hair, or maybe hers. It's the money, she continued. Being rich has fucked with people's heads. Forty years ago our parents survived Pol Pot, and now, what the holy fuck are we even doing? Obsessing over wedding favors? Wasting hundreds of dollars on getting our hair done? Do you know what the traditional clothing lady said to me? She said, it's good we hired her to do the wedding outfits because most Cambodians here used to be low country people, and no one but her carries the expensive styles from Phnom Penh. Can you believe that? Apparently once you have money, you develop fake problems. You should hear the shit people tell me when I do their taxes. Monica stopped going through the bag and considered Bond, her eyes lighting up. Marlon's a perfect example. She said. He was making hella money, and then he got anxiety and depressed or whatever, and then he got addicted to drugs. It's the money, I swear. Like, do you think our parents had anxieties when they lived through the genocide? No, they worried about fucking surviving. Bond took a drink and clenched his jaw. Sure, Marlon drove him crazy you had to be a selfish dumbass to get roaring ass drunk in front of your mother when she was forever paranoid about your history with substance abuse but when had Monica become an expert on his family? And where was Monica, Monica when his family had no money? Where was anyone? You really have no idea what you're talking about, Bond said. What? Are you offended? Monica taunted. You don't need to be defensive. I'm not your mom. Marlon's really messed up. He's always been. We're all messed up. Monica shouted. Do you think any of us aren't? But when you have money, you start focusing on every little way you've been fucked over. And meanwhile, the rest of us deal. I can't imagine what I'd do with the money this wedding cost. With the money the bride's parents have, or fuck, your parents. She whacked her head repeatedly, to satisfy an elusive itch buried somewhere beneath her frozen hair. Like, oh my god, you know the bride made a store her money box, so she could keep it as a memory. She kept texting to remind me not to throw it away. And don't get me started on how she, like, needed us to put the Ong Pavs in her car before she left the reception. Like she couldn't trust her cousins? It's not like she doesn't know where we all live. I bet she was texting me while counting all her stupid fucking money. Bond clenched his jaw harder. He had spent an hour following Monica around, listening to her rant about the wedding. He watched in complicity as she tried proving just how much smarter, how much more responsible, she was than the bride than Marlon, than him, than everyone because what? Because when she got drunk she completed random unnecessary tasks? And now he'd found out the money box was empty. Fuck. Fucking shit, Bond thought. And fuck Monica.
He swore the sneer across her face communicated everyone's exact thoughts on him and his brother. Those poor parents, he imagined all of them thinking. Look at their disgraceful kids, tarnishing their parents' reputations with drug addictions and frivolous artistic delusions. Why had those parents worked so hard for a future like this? If only the cousin understood how much he toiled away for his family. The countless times, while growing up, he had cleaned the entire apartment, walked a mile to buy groceries, and cooked the family meals because his dad was working night shifts or cramming for engineering school because Marlon was out with his friends being angry in the world because his mom cycled through depressive episodes, leaving her so crippled that her sons 12 and 16, during the worst of it had to beg her just to get out of bed, to eat, to live. For God's sake, here he was, scheming to find proof of his uncle gifting nothing at his cousin's wedding. All for his mom. Suddenly, he found everything unbearable the sight of Monica, the thumping vocal runs of Mariah Carey, the whoops and dams coming from what sounded like a dance battle in the garage. He pushed past Monica to enter a bedroom, knocking the bag from her grasp. Dozens of used, damp candles from the reception spilled onto the ground. I was counting those. Bond heard Monica yell from behind the door. V. The game master hatches a new plan to expose Visif. The rules of the drinking game eluded the drunken cousins, but that stopped no one from trash-talking their opponents like they got paid six-figure salaries to administer verbal beatdowns to their own flesh and blood. Marlon the self-appointed game master had concocted for the garage crowd an amalgamation of beer pong, dice, but without actual dice, an aerobics workout, truth or dare, and darts. Darts, with crumpled paper instead of actual darts. And people were engrossed, even the famous singer. Recovering drug addict or not, Marlon was the fun cousin. The final round had started, and Visif, competing against a bridesmaid for the championship title, was getting booed out of the dance circle for refusing to pop and lock. This is dumb. Visith said. Let's go back to throwing balls in cups. You are too scared to dance in front of us? The famous singer asked, her proper tone more belittling than regular trash talk. Wait we can pivot, Marlon said, proud to have used the word pivot in a context not involving his online coding classes which he was taking for the tech boot camp his parents were paying for because he'd ruined his career in finance by sinking into an Adderall-induced psychosis, right in front of his old boss. A brilliant idea had sparked in his head, and Marlon wanted to capitalize on it before his eventual come down, before he felt the sensation, like he often did after midnight, that the whole world was stomping on his chest. He quickly looked around, then started gathering supplies from the cabinets. This new plan would expose Visith once and for all, Marlon thought, fighting his drunken spins by throwing himself into meaningful action. On the table in the center of the garage, Marlon unloaded an armful of supplies and proceeded to tear paper into a pile of scraps. He secretly marked a piece and then passed them out to everyone, along with several pens. Write down the amount you gifted the newlyweds, Marlon said, earning looks of ske skepticism. He handed Visith and the bridesmaid a scrap of paper each, making sure to give his uncle the one he'd marked. Don't worry, it's anonymous. When everyone was done, Marlon collected the scraps in a tin can. Listen up. He said, standing in between the final two competitors. This, here, is the last game, whoever draws the higher number is declared best cousin. That's lame yelled one of the Mariah Carey, loving bridesmaids. I want to see some dancing. Guys, don't be fooled by how basic this game seems. Marlon said, punctuating his words with his free hand, his heartbeat sprinting into a belligerent thumping. The winner we deserve shouldn't be decided by dancing or skill. Trust me. Choosing one of these numbers is a test of fate, of what the universe thinks we deserve, who it deems our winner. This is about Buddha. About karma. Are we destined for greatness? Or failure? Some people are born winners, am I right? And others, unfortunately, are born losers. This is what we're testing. Just pick a number so this drunk will shut the fuck up, someone said to Visith, and the last bridesmaid standing. Red in the face and covered in cognac-infused sweat, 
Visit stepped forward and rolled up his shirt sleeve. I got this in the bag, he said. I mean, I was born a prince. If Pol Pot didn't ruin Cambodia, I would have been the oldest son of the richest family in the province. It's in my blood. Marlin couldn't help but notice the Rolex strapped to his uncle's wrist, the multiple diamond rings circling his fingers, as Visith fished a number out of the can. Did he think he deserved more than this, Marlin wondered, and the thought unleashed an exhaustion that had been creeping on him all night, the feeling that nothing would ever be enough, that his entire existence had started with some chemical deficiency. He wanted another drink, a hit. 700. Visit shouted, holding his number high in the air. Then the bridesmaid stuck her hand into the can. When she pulled out her, her scrap, Marlin saw that it was the marked one he'd given to Visith. 500, she said, disappointed. Visith hooped in celebration. He punched the air. Say hello to the best cousin. He hollered in a cry of triumph. This is bullshit, the bridesmaid said. I would have totally won a dance off. She pointed antagonistically at Visith. But you just had to be a baby. The crowd roared in agreement. He doesn't deserve the win. Someone shouted. Make him dance. Someone else shouted, and the rowdy cousins started chanting, Dance. 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 Fuck you all. Visit slurred. Bunch of sore losers. Marlin stepped away from Visit, aligning himself with the crowd. Motherfucker has to be lying, he thought, there was no way he gifted that much money. Let me tell you the difference between winning and losing, Visit now said, clearing the floor with a grand flailing of his arms, and also the slobber he spit on everyone. It's shame. Losers have shame and winners don't. You think you're gonna make me feel bad about changing the game? Visit scoffed an aggressive laugh, loud enough that the cousins went silent. Fuck that, he continued. That's exactly how you win. How do you think our family became rich? How some of us stayed rich while others sat on their asses doing jack shit? It's time for a lesson, straight from my mouth to your ignorant, ignorant brains. Visit wiped the sweat off his forehead, prepared himself to take down the crowd, to assert himself as the eldest cousin, while Marlin suddenly understood how dumb his plan had been, how easy it would have been to jot down any old number onto that scrap of paper, how maybe everyone was right to see him as the privileged failure whose parents kept bailing him out. Our family, visit started, we used to jump on any advantage we could. Great Great Gong came from China, stepped onto a piece of land in Batambang, and he decided, this shit is mine. He didn't care that villagers already lived there. The baller just started building his rice factory, then convinced the villagers it would benefit them to work for him. Why worry about land when you can clock in hours and get paid salaries? Did he tell them how much money he would make versus them? Hell no, he wasn't a goddamn loser. He made business decisions without shame, took whatever he fucking wanted. Chest puffed up, nostrils flared out, Visith walked the invisible perimeter between him and the cousins. That's why I'm successful, and you dumbass aren't, I remember how we became rich. I don't let anything set me back, see, I don't give a fuck. Visit stopped when he reached Marlin and the famous singer. He was staring Marlin down, snickering and heaving like a madman, with bloodshot eyes and an assault of body odor. You know what I'm talking about, Visit said, petting Marlin's head. And then, as if to prove his larger point, Visit turned toward the famous singer, grabbed her by the waist, and forced a kiss on her mouth. The cousins in the garage flinched, at the sight of their uncle's sloppy moves, a couple of the bridesmaids even gasping, and Marlin watched in disbelief as the famous singer shoved Visith off, as she whacked him several times hard enough to make it clear that a line had been seriously crossed, but light enough to avoid a real scene. He found himself thinking, someone should punch this fucker in the face, and as soon as he'd completed the thought, Marlin's right first was colliding into his uncle's nose, forcing a howl of pain from his throat so that of course Visith retaliated by punching his aggressor in the ribs, cracking one or two, Marlin swore, groaning, crouching from the pain, and then lunging at his uncle, both of them falling to the ground, 
hammering blows into guts and maneuvering skulls into headlocks and limbs. Into half Nelsons, until neither could maintain a steady breath at all, really, their panting and slobbering the music of pure, childish violence, and until Monica burst into the garage, ordering all the dumbstruck bystanders to pull the idiot man babies off each other. From across the room, Marlon stared at the blood dripping from those nostrils as the lunatic, held back by two boy cousins, continued to scream at him. His thoughts mushrooming into a dense fog, Marlon felt the alcohol draining from his aching, bruised body. He considered bailing on this party, just walking out the door and going anywhere, like all those times he had joined another sports team, started another extracurricular activity, hung out in another empty parking lot downing cough syrup with his friends, just so he could avoid dealing with his dad, his mom, even his younger brother. Of course this party had ended with blood everywhere. He was born in the midst of chaos, so how the hell could he ever prevent it? 6. The famous singer teaches everyone the traditional but grabbing game of matrimony. Marlon made it as far as the living room before the guilt stopped him. Leaving Bond to finish their mission alone simply wasn't an option. And where would he even go? He wasn't in high school anymore. There were no friends to hit up. There was nothing for him outside of this house, this party, his family. All he had now was Bond. He stumbled his way back up the hallway, bursting through each door to see if his younger brother stood behind it. After walking right into a closet, and then a bathroom, where a bridesmaid was just then vomiting into the toilet, he found Bond smoking weed in a bedroom. The sight of his brother immediately lulled Marlon into a calm. Hey, it's a you painting, he said, sitting next to Bond at the foot of the bed. Ming bought it at my first show, Bond said, giving Marlon the joint. What the hell was that in the garage? Sounded like a zoo out there. Nothing. Visitha's nose might be broken. My fault, I guess. Bond shot Marlon a knowing glance. Don't look at me like that, Marlon said. He totally deserved it. Probably. So he didn't gift any money? He claims he did. Bond seized the joint from Marlon. He took a hit, then blew smoke in his brother's face. You don't deserve this, and also shouldn't have it. Come on, Marlon said. I'm super sober now, after Visith beat the fuck out of me. One of my ribs might be, like, really broken. Yeah, that's not how alcohol works. Man. You know you want to get high with your older bro. Fine, here. Bond lifted the joint to his brother's mouth, and Marlon inhaled its smoke deeply, only to immediately start co coughing. For a recovering drug addict, you really can't handle your shit, Bond said, and they both laughed. Then the brothers studied the painting in front of them, their mom with a riotous perm, standing in a field of rose bushes, donning the kind of bright patterns found in the 80s. I've always liked this one. Yeah? So why'd you get so fucked up at my show? The real question is why weren't you fucked up, Marlon said, grinning. He passed the joint back to his brother. I mean, for a starving hipster artist and all, you've gotten pretty uptight. Bond sighed. I used to be so cool, he half-joked. He remembered the night of his first show, how he'd known instantly Marlon was relapsing, maybe with a handful of painkillers, a dash of Adderall for sure, to get through his 12-hour workday. He sensed it from Marlon's clammy hands, his dilated, searching pupils, the way his greasy hair kept falling into his face. Why had he then allowed his brother to drink an entire bottle of wine, before passing out in the corner, triggering yet another spell of their mother's killer depressions? He looked at Marlon. It was hard not to admire the way his brother's features seemed a perfect mingling of their parents. My bullshit probably sucked the coolness right out of you. Marlon stared intently ahead, his expression dead serious. I'm sorry, you know? For being, like, the worst older brother. Don't worry about it, Bond said brusquely, feeling a dull pang in his chest. If you weren't, dad would be, like, way more pissed over the loans I have from majoring in art. Through his stoned eyes, the painting had started to bleed into the wall, roses proliferating across his frame of view. 
He wondered if Marlin could see the same vision he did, before realizing how stupid a thought that was, before he noticed a familiar tinge of anguish in his brother's slight grin. He knew Marlin was waiting for him to say something else. Else. Perhaps his joke about their dad hadn't been enough to alleviate the pressure, the guilt, the crazy whirlwind of thoughts, his older brother was always feeling. But he couldn't bring himself to utter a word, not even to mention what he'd been obsessing over all night the mission, Marlin's drinking, their mom. The door swung open, and Bond and Marlin looked over to find the famous singer. Fuck, Bond said, Ash dropping onto his pants, this is the room you're staying in? The famous singer raised one eyebrow, gleamed a patronizing look, and waved over at the piles and piles of her luggage in the corner. Then she sat down and accepted the joint from Bond a peace offering. In Cambodia, we put this on pizza, she said, exhaling smoke, and call it happy pizza. You should write a song about that, Marlon said. I am writing a song about it, the famous singer said, to Marlon's surprise. She sucked in another hit, killing the last of the weed. You think I am making a joke? No, I am serious. Cambodians, we never let ourselves enjoy life. It is always thinking on the past, worrying for the future. That's no good, Bond responded. Did you find out how much money Visit gifted, or do you need to inquire with the bride, like I said? Not entirely confirmed, Marlon said. I expect little from that child, the famous singer said, standing up and smoothing over the creases in her dress. Come with me. I have an idea, a good one. Both in a daze, Marlon and Bond followed the famous singer into the living room, where Mariah Carey's voice still blasted from the speaker. The cousins were milling about, some too drunk to change the playlist, others already too hungover to care. Visit sat on the sectional couch, stripped down to his undershirt. Surrounded by her fellow bridesmaids, Monica stood by the kitchen island, furiously discussing the bottomless stupidity of every boy cousin at the party. Someone had made cognac Gatorade margaritas, and half-empty cups of bright green littered all the hard surfaces, and even some of the softer, rounder ones like the couch cushions these cups precarious in their positioning. The famous singer instructed Marlon and Bond to line up five chairs in a row, in front of the sectional and everyone else in the room. When the formation was finished, she stood up on a chair, drawing the room's attention with her expert stage presence. A little bird told me, the famous singer said, that Visit will also be married soon, to a woman living in Cambodia. Yeah, Visit said, that's true. He glared at Marlon as if he were about to tackle him to the ground. Well, if you want to marry a woman from Cambodia, you must obey tradition, the famous singer said. So I will teach everyone a ceremony to perform at Visitha's wedding. The famous singer gestured at Visith. Here, take my place and turn your back to your audience. Then she pointed for Bond, Marlon, and two other boy cousins to join Visith on the remaining chairs. I will act as Visith's bride for this demonstration, the famous singer continued. In this game, the bride will be blindfolded, and she must touch all the men's behinds and guests, just from touching, which behind belongs to her husband. This cannot be real, Monica said, scowling with disgust and delight, to which the famous singer beamed a sternness that convinced all the cousins of the ceremony's deep legitimacy. Now, let me start the demonstration. With rapt attention, the room watched the famous singer pretend to pat the thighs and glutes of the standing men. The palpable awkwardness of the situation made everyone smile, and when the mere proximity of the famous singer, singer and her alarming beauty almost caused Visith to slip and fall to the floor, everyone burst into laughter. For a brief moment, the cousins, even the ones elevated on the chairs, were again a bunch of kids, a brand new generation in a strange country, still learning what it means to be Cambodian. After the demonstration was over, the cousins returned to their conversations and their half-empty drinks. The five men descended from their positions. On his way back to the sectional, Visith rammed into Marlon with a forceful shove of his shoulder, but before anyone could react, Bond took hold of Marlon's arm and pulled him down, so that the brothers were now just slumping into those chairs. Yeah, I don't think you want to start another fight, Bond said. Not after the ass-grabbing wedding game of our ancestors. Soon the famous singer was sitting down next to them. 
She covertly handed Bond a leather object, nodding with a stiff and steady motion to keep her hair in place. It belongs to Visith, she said, winking to signal that she'd picked their uncle's pocket. Quickly shifting to block Visitha's view, Bond looked down, turning the stolen wallet over in his hands, feeling its bulky heft. What are you waiting for? Marlin asked. All right, Bond said, calm your shit. He pried the wallet open and there, inside, nestled between a wad of bills, was a red envelope. How did you know this would be here? He asked the famous singer, who shrugged and said, I assumed having his possessions would help. It is simple logic. What does this mean? Marlin asked. Well, Bond answered, it really does look like Visith was hiding his own pov, you know, from everyone else. Wow, Marlin said. So I was actually right? Yeah, motherfucker definitely gave squat, Bond replied, and tossed the wallet under his chair. Dad will have his proof now, Marlin said. And Mom will be happy, Bond said. Well, happier. And, and with that, the brothers sighed in mutual relief. They both yes, Bond as well, to Marlin's delight grinned at one another with juvenile giddiness. For the moment, they could do nothing else. 7. The drunken conversations Cambos have at 3.42 a.m. Sometimes I forget we grew up with the same stuff, you know? Marlin said, before taking a drink from a dwindling bottle of Hennessy. They were sitting outside on the front lawn, their asses chilled by the morning dew. Like, do you remember when we were kids and dad would be working at the power plant? So it would be us two trying to make mom feel better, cooking her, like, the worst food ever, like those grilled cheeses we microwaved. Yeah, and then I was the one who dealt with mom, Bond said, taking the bottle from Marlin. In high school, you were always busy. He poured cognac into his mouth, and then stared out into the dark sky. The other day I had this realization, you know, that I actually started making art because it was the easiest way to pass time. Mom would lie in bed, staring off into space, talking about her dead siblings, and I'd draw on the floor of her room. Marlin considered his brother's profile. He thought about all the times he'd raged too hard in his life, how often he'd taken his parents too seriously, as an influence so immense he needed to uphold their expectations and also transgress against them, because to have just one reaction would never suffice. That was dumb of me. I'll drink to that, Bond said, bringing the bottle back to his lips. It's weird, Marlin said. I've been back at home, you know, and everything's reversed from when we grew up. Dad makes tons of money now. Mom's healthy and she's hella extra about making sure I don't relapse. She cooks, like, every day. She does my laundry, and I keep telling her I can do it hell, I used to do her laundry. So, like, what are you trying to say? I don't know, man. Don't you find that a little weird? Bond peered down the hill, across the lawn, at the Lexus SUV parked on the street. Sure, he had noticed all that, he'd lived at how he and his brother were raised in a one-bedroom apartment and then, out of nowhere, well into his own adolescence, his parents upgraded to a four-bedroom house in a gated community. But what was there to say? The whiplash he felt about their lives seemed inexpressible, at least in words. Maybe this was the curse of being a painter. His exact thoughts and feelings solidified in oils, only coming to him slowly, latently, after summoning mental images that might translate into scenes, once brush was applied to canvas. Oh, Marlin said, I forgot. He sifted through his pockets, removed a handful of wedding favors, and piled them on the lawn. Scored some candy. Bond grabbed a favor and examined it. He scoffed. What's wrong? I just realized how hungry I am. The bride was fucking stingy about the food, am I right? Marlin said. What was up with those portions? Give a bunch of Cambo's money, Bond answered, and they're still gonna believe a coup d'etat's coming for us. And that, my beautiful brother, Marlin said, is what makes the Cambo world go round. Bond unwrapped the wedding favor. He popped the stale chocolate into his mouth. I do find it strange though, that we ended up where we, like, ended up. 
Yeah, it really is, Marlin said. Glad you also think it. He threw an empty favor into the street, and Bond, without even thinking, elbowed Marlin's side for him to stop. Bond took a deep breath. He felt calm, but his hands were shaky. Shaky. Dizzy from the alcohol, he could feel a headache coming. He focused on his shoes, held tightly onto his bottle, and when the sky stopped spinning, he assembled the words he'd intended to say all night, I. I thought you were doing better. And Marlin, having expected this, exhaled. Yeah. I thought so too. The brothers faced one another, each giving that look they had been exchanging ever since they could remember. Even when you're the biggest fool, I got you. I mean, Bond started, I know it's just alcohol and weed, but mom. You know how many jobs I've tried applying for? Marlin asked. Bond shook his head. I didn't know you were doing that already. Yeah, well, I can't keep track anymore, Marlin said. And it's not like I don't get interviews, but I just. I can't formulate thoughts anymore, you know? I get asked these questions over the phone, like what are you hoping for in a team or describe your strengths and weaknesses, and my brain my brain's totally fucked. With no words to say, Bond placed his hand on his brother's shoulder. Also not helpful we got autogenocided, Marlin said, falling back onto the grass. Not at all, Bond responded, sure as hell isn't. Then he found himself, yet again, breaking into laughter, which in turn made Marlin crack up, and after a moment of more giddiness, of this necessary nonsense, after they finally settled down, they soaked in the silence, let it collect over them. When's the next time I'm gonna see you anyway? Not sure, Bond answered, registering a disappointment that Marlin could barely disguise. But when I visit, maybe we can actually do something for a change. Like, go bowling or something. Now that would be hella fun. Nice, really. Right. So let's make it happen. Before returning to the house, the brothers emptied the rest of the favors, methodically unwrapping the mesh around each, until not one chocolate was left uneaten. And they imagined aloud all the nice things they could do together. They imagined a future severed from their past mistakes, the history they inherited, a world in which with no questions asked, no hesitation felt they completed the simple actions they thought, discussed and dreamed.